uh, at noon. So. Okay. Great. Take it away, food resilience. <laughs> well, this is going to be an experiment because this is a bunch of new equipment that I've never used before. Uh -huh. So we're going to see whether or not it works. So everybody's going to have to put a little lobster mic on here so that we can get some sort of a recording of it. Um, actually, I've got my little This supposedly doesn't go out and dance the slides. Okay. My guess is that everybody in this room uh, pretty much agrees that we're going to have to get rid of fossil fuels. Say it. Do what? Yay. <laughs> get rid of fossil fuels. Actually use the petrochemicals for a better purpose. Well, there's many different nuances. <laughs> However, if you look around you, you'll realize that if you wanted to replace anything in this room, it would take fossil fuels, and it would be you would find that it was made someplace else. The sun. Uh, and that's a, a bit of a challenge because that's true whether you're in this room or your home or driving between here and there or any place else that you want to do. Even if you want to dig a hole, it's probably made done with a shovel that's made of steel, which was forged in a in a foundry that used fossil fuels to heat up the, uh, the materials. So uh, whatever it is that we currently know how to do. It's using fossil fuels and it's doing something, it's doing it someplace else. Let me say this is what Craig, do you want the lights off or down or something? Uh, yeah, probably would, would help. Anybody in the back get the lights? Get the lights, please. Um, but it's not just everything that uh, relies on fossil fuels, it specifically includes our food. Good. And because of the fact that everybody in the world basically has adopted a just-in-time strategy for inventory, yes. uh, Tucson has only a few days of food in our stores, in our stores and warehouses, less than two weeks of food in most people's homes, and pretty much all of it comes from thousands of miles away by means of a global supply chain that nobody is in control of. So Tucson needs to become more food resilient. But how's that possible? Well, <laughs> yeah, my, I think it is. Okay. It turns out that it's likely that uh, the easiest thing to do to become more food resilient is actually starts with food. And that's because we have both the water and the history that's required. The <coughs> advancing itself, I don't want that. Um, okay. Right now, all the utilities pump about 140,000 acre feet a year out of the ground. It mostly comes from CAP water, which is a half a mile from the floor, feet and hundreds of miles away. Uh, but Tucson receives almost 200,000 acre feet of harvestable rain. And what that means is that um, we receive tens of billions of gallons of water every year. The problem is that we waste basically all of it uh, because there's a trick. Uh, the bigger the watershed, the smaller the percentage of the water actually ends up being recoverable. So if your watershed is your house, it's the roof of your house, you probably get about 80% of the rain that falls on your house in a year. But if you expand to the size of, say, a neighborhood or a few blocks or something like that, it drops to about 30% of the rain that falls, and if you wait until the water gets all the way down to the Santa Cruz or the Rito, it's less than 2%. More than 98% of the water that we receive every year evaporates, and unless it's used for something important in the meantime, it's basically lost. So if we want to have billions of gallons of rainfall, we're going to have to use it right where it falls. And that means basically in trees that shade our streets, that shade our neighborhoods. And if we're going to have literally millions of rainwater trees 
what a tragedy it would be if we didn't use many of millions of them to grow food with. The other reason that Tucson can become more food resilient is because we're at the crossroads of many cultures and many climates. One of the theories of permaculture is that it's those edges where things that are different things meet, where change can happen, where innovation occurs. Tucson is at the intersection of many cultures, many climates, and that's why uh, we got the, uh, uh, the City of Gastronomy de designation, the, the world designation. Stop. <laughs> Because we have a 4,000 year history and many different things that make up the, the Tucson that we have here. So what does a, a food resilient community look like? It has a thing that works. Uh, well, it's beautiful. It's abundant. It has lots of delicious food. It's got lots of shade, community, and many green jobs. Probably many thousands of green jobs. So, what we do with tens of billions of gallons of harvestable rainfall every year really can make a huge difference in this community. So how do we do that? Well, one <coughs> of the tools that may be available to us is the Food Resilience Project. The goal is to uh, train volunteers who will uh, support small groups of neighbors as they learn, grow, eat, and share the abundant food that grows nearby. So there's a whole series of different strategies that we're, we're considering, and uh, we'd love to hear suggestions about additional ones. But basically, uh, we can work together to create tens of millions of pounds of delicious food and do it in ways that bring a community together. So the Food Resilience Project is actually just one of the tools we have because uh, Somebody want to hit the lights? Uh, we already have a lot of groups in town that are already doing great work. And four of the people representing those groups are with us here tonight. So um, Nick Henry is with the Community Food Bank. Uh, and I guess you're now the head of the resource, uh, Food Resource Center. Uh, fantastic organization that's uh, doing great work throughout the community. Uh, Oscar. Uh, Dina is the, uh, one of the lead uh, teachers at Changemaker High School, um, one of my favorite schools. I think you're doing great work. Um, and what's part of the title you've got? Is I'm a manager of the uh, Restorative Urban College and Agriculture Program. That's a high school. Yeah. Wow. Um, Sarah Brown is the co director they of Water. They didn't his title. Do what? Couldn't hear his title. <laughs> I am I am the restorative uh, urban ecology and agriculture program manager at Changemaker High School, and I'll talk a little bit about the program and what we're doing. Okay. Sarah Brown is the uh, co-director of Watershed Management Group. I'm sure many of you know WMG uh, for the, the great work that they're doing. And then uh, Carolyn Needhammer, I've only known for maybe 30 years or something like that. Um, and she is uh, an expert in the people, the plants, the ecosystems, the food in the Southwest. So they're going to briefly talk about some of the things that is currently going on uh, with their organizations uh, to promote food resilience, but also uh, take a few minutes to sort of think with us about where we could be going, what sort of options there are available to make Tucson more food resilient. So uh, Nick, you want to? Well, I'm going to start here, or you, I guess we can sit at the table. Everybody needs to use the, the movie there. <laughs> okay, so um, can you all hear me in back? Would you prefer if I stand up there? Yeah. I got half yes and half yes. <laughs> If you've ever uh, participated with Pima County Food Alliance, every once in a while we do food trivia. So I, I pulled some questions together that specifically I thought had to do with our local history and sustainability in this area. Um, 
couple of them were referenced, so if you paid attention, you might have figured them out. Um, so, space reference at the Central Arizona Project, where, which is where we get a lot of our water. It's a series of canals and aqueducts designed to transport Colorado River water over to Central and Southern Arizona, most of which is used for agriculture. The terminus is near Tucson, but what lake over 300 miles away along the Arizona border serves as the source of the water? Let's, we got some meads, we got some Havasus. Any other ideas? Raise your hand for Havasu. Raise your hand for me. It's actually Havasu. The giveaway was yeah. state law. Yeah, state law. Um, so this is related. Arizona's farmers are an aging batch, but a spate of young farmers has joined the business, resulting in the first decrease in average age of Arizona farm operation, operators in decades. For, well, I wrote this for five points. We're not actually doing it for one. What is the average age of Arizona farm operators according to the latest agricultural census? Well, this was 2012. Can we get a choice of 58? I hear. 30. 30. 30. 51. 51. <laughs> Any other guesses? 60. 60. It's 58. You got it right on the head. And it's kind of a trick question because the the average age went down from like 58.8 to. And then finally, this, this was in the presentation. Tucson is often cited as the longest continuously cultivated site in North America. How many years is it estimated to have been under cultivation? I know, I know. <laughs> Four million years. Four thousand. <laughs> so anyway, those, those are all marginally related, or at least fun, so I thought I'd mention that. Um, another little statistic, I, you've maybe heard that um, Arizona imports roughly 95, or Tucson imports roughly 95% of its food um, from out of Tucson. So that becomes a problem, and so I'm here representing the food bank. It becomes a problem when we think about resiliency, uh, because if there's some sort of interruption in that supply, then we have a major food insecurity problem. I mean, it's also a food sovereignty question. So food sovereignty is sort of this idea of controlling the means of your production. And so if you're depending on the outside for 95% of your food, then obviously there's a food sovereignty issue. Um, so most of you, if you've heard of food banks, um, what, what do you guys think of when you think of a food bank? Any ideas back there? Community gardens, all right, you must live in Tucson. <laughs> other folks from other communities that maybe don't know the food bank here, what do you think of when you hear the word food bank, the word food bank? Back then. A box of food. A box of food. Yep. Anyone else? That, that kind of sums it up. Right? All packaged, processed food. Packaged and processed food, yeah. Which is not healthy. Which tends not to be healthy, yeah. So obviously we do a lot of that kind of work. We've been doing it for 40 years. This is our 40th year in operation. Um, and we put out roughly 28 to 30 million pounds of food every year. Um, so that's a large part of what we do. But over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, another component of what we do has been growing. Um, and so the way we sort of talk about it is, is, is we put out food boxes. And there's you know many, many partners through which we do that. Um, and we call that feeding the line. Um, but we're also realizing after 40 years, hunger has not gone away. Um, and so we need to try and get out ahead of it. Um, and so we need to find ways to shorten the line. So that's sort of a, a, a little way of thinking about what my department does. So it's, as Trey said, it's called the Food Resource Center. Um, and really what we're doing is, is trying to um, employ a number of strategies that help shorten that line. Um, so there's, there are a few that are related to um, food. The most obvious one is that we teach people how to grow food. Um, if you've ever been to um, our garden at our main warehouse, you know that we have workshops there every spring and every fall. Um, and we have a number of programs. Um, I've worked with Oscar in the past on doing school programs. Um, but really, one of the most exciting things that we've started doing recently is you, you may know that we run farmers markets. Um, and we've been doing that for over 10 years. Um, and so for a number of years, People have said, if only you know farmers are in such a tenuous place. 
you know, most of them are living under you know, the poverty line themselves. Um, and, and most of them, local farmers are selling through farmers markets and some sort of like direct to consumer um, type market. Um, and that works, but you know, we hear this all the time. Someone says, hey, we want to start a new farmers market. And the farmers are like, oh, please God, no. Like, I don't, I don't, ha I can't be in so many places. Yeah, hands nodding her head over there at, at, at the farmer. Just they don't have the capacity to be at that many markets. Um, and so, um, so we've been working to sort of diversify the market for farmers. Uh, and so what we've done um, is we've partnered with about 15 or so farmers from Southern Arizona, and we're aggregating all of their product at the food bank. It's convenient because we have a whole warehouse. We have you know, refrigerated storage, cold storage. We have fleets of trucks driving all over Southern Arizona. And we thought, hey, why not just you know, throw, a, th throw some purchased food onto that and deliver it to um, one of our schools or one of our hospitals that we work with. Um, so that was kind of how the idea was born. We're figuring out the logistics because it's not really just as simple as throwing a basket of food on a truck. Um, so we're working through those details. Um, but that's been a really exciting project over the last year. We've been doing this for about a year. We've sold um, $40,000 worth of, um, of product to TMC, she's not medical center, and TUSD, the, the largest school district. So we have contracts with them. Um, and we, I should say, we the food bank sort of coordinated and we, we do the sale, um, but most of the profits are going to the farmers. And the reason for that is we see farmers as really sort of a unique type of client. You know, we have our, our folks coming in who are in need and need, need a meal, um, but we also think if we're ever going to be able to provide healthy, local, fresh food, then we really have to invest in the farmers um, in our community. So that's been interesting, and the people in my department get that very well. Um, and overall, I'd say that the food bank gets it. Um, but you know, Megan Headings, who's our director of operations, she and I have a great relationship. Um, but for her, like she's all about millions of pounds of food. And that's that's their world. So we're we're working on all of those things, and it's been fun to kind of try and figure out how how all these pieces work together. Together. Um, another thing um, that we do is through all of our you know we've been teaching classes on gardening for a number of years, and people ask us, well, what about the water? What do you guys think about the water? And so we have for a long time been teaching people you know low water irrigation techniques, um, and we teach rainwater classes and rainwater classes. And we also rely on WMG a lot to, to do a lot of that education. Um, and lately, out at our Las Malpitas farm, it's an urban farm um, that we run, we've been piloting probably some of, most of you guys have seen these. Um, but does anyone know what this is? An olla pot. Right, so olla, Spanish for like a clay pot. And so the more traditional form is you have a clay pot with like a lid or a, a little cap, and you bury that clay pot in the water, or, or sorry, in the ground, and you pour water into it and it just seeps, you know, the water seeps out over the course of a couple days and it's an ancient technique um, for irrigating that is really water conscious because it's below the surface of the soil and so that doesn't evaporate. Um, so a local guy, we've been partnering with him, um, who said, well, let's take that and merge it with kind of 21st century technology, you know, with some poly. And this is, you know, a lot of, a lot of the problems that people have with well, let me ask you this: How many how many people have you how many people here have um, like a, a watering or an irrigation system at home? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you hate your watering or your irrigation? System? <laughs> right. They can be very complicated. So this is really cool because you simply plug it into a bucket of water that's raised. You can put it on a chair or whatever, and it's all gravity fed. And you fill that bucket up, you know, once a week or something like that. So we've been working with um, this fellow who's producing these. You can make a, a homemade version of these with you know, we can invert two pots on each other, kind of seal them together, and use the hole in top. And you know, so, so there's easy, cheap ways to do it yourself. But you can also buy these. Um, and in our first trial run, um, we were able to um, reduce our water usage by 80 percent and increase our yield by 50 percent. That was with tomatoes. So, kind of miraculous. It's really cool. Um, so, yeah, we're we're thinking about all of those things as we think about growing food. Um, and, and all together, so this is a hard thing to track, but we're, we're trying to track, okay, so you know, we grow food, we support schools and farmers in growing food, can we sort of quantify that? And we're on track this fiscal year to support about 1.5 million servings of food that, that will be produced in Southern Arizona. And 
So we're taking that seriously. It's funny to take that. So Feeding America is the large network of food banks that used to be called Second Harvest. And so if you, if you, I was on the phone with the director of media relations the other day, and he wanted interesting ideas around what food banks are doing. And so I told him about some of this stuff, and I think that was a little too interesting for him. <laughs> a little too out of the box, but we think it's pretty cool. Um, and then the last thing I would just say, um, I know Trace has talked a lot about like you know gleaning and sort of capturing water where it's at. And so one of the ways that we support that other than just the classes is, is we, we're really supporting backyard gardeners. Um, so all of these little like micro farms or micro, you know gardens, um, and, and a lot of those folks just want to grow for themselves. Um, but what we've been working with them to do is find a way to actually bring that produce to market. Um, so we have what's called the Abundant Harvest Cooperative, which you could think of as sort of a consignment program on steroids. It's, it's a lot higher capacity than that. But all the folks around town who are growing their own food and very well could be capturing water from their roofs to grow food um, can now come to us and drop that food off. And we sell it either at our farmer's markets or now we're starting to sell it through kind of the, the, the institutional outlets that we have. Um, so that's a way of kind of um, uh, seeding or incubating like micro businesses around food that we think is pretty cool. Um, probably close to out of time. Thanks for reminding. I don't have a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question. Is, uh, this thing you just talked about, uh, are, are you actually remunerating the uh, people who are growing the food? Oh, yeah. they. they it, so, it depends on their role, but they keep about 85% of the. the okay, so, so a small farmer or somebody or a small gardener who comes up with a several hundred pounds of zucchini, mm -hmm. that's one plant. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, they would bring that to you and then they would get something for that to help them? Yeah, now if, if it happens in a season where we just have a total glut and we can't sell that stuff, then we, you know you get you get what ends up getting sold. And if it's wasted, then you know we, there's nothing we can do about that. But we're, but we're working to find more avenues to kind of distribute it, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. All right, I think we're gonna have time for questions um, I want to thank, uh, start off by thanking Sustainable Tucson for inviting me uh, for putting together uh, these monthly meetings. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about myself, you know, where I come from, who I am, what I'm doing. And then I'm going to talk about the school and, and then the program that we created. Um, so I'm originally from Los Angeles. I was born and raised and, and lived in the city my whole life. I moved to Southern Arizona six years ago uh, with my wife. And um, when we moved here, we, we, were, we got hit right away with uh, appreciating uh, water, right, the air, and the food. Um, originally, my, both of my parents are from Jalisco, Mexico, so I had the privilege during the summer, my parents would send me off to Mexico, and on both sides of my grandparents, on both sides of my parents, um, my, my grandparents were farmers, ranchers in, in Jalisco. Um, so that that's where you know I learned how to work with my hands. I learned how to, how to work um, and just appreciate and observe uh, nature, uh, how to raise animals. Um, so let me talk about the school. Um, and, and the school has an interesting history because it, it was founded in 2012 as the Western Institute for Leadership Development. And the, the idea behind the school was, was to make it a project-based learning school. Um, last year, uh, we changed the name to Changemaker High School. Uh, there's a team of, of educators that I'm working with that are doing some amazing programs, everything from art uh, to uh, science, citizen science. Uh, all kinds of different projects uh, that are coming out of uh, the math class with, with our, our bioengineer teacher. Um, I, I come into the teaching profession uh, seven years ago. I uh, originally started teaching in Oakland. And my focus was to teach history, uh, government. And our history is very unique in the sense that it's war after war after war for national and, and fights for natural resources, right? Things that some natural resources because we haven't been able to manage and take care of them. Um, and so when I moved to Arizona, it was when I first was introduced to, okay, well, here's a, here's a school garden uh, in the south side of Tucson. I started teaching at uh, Chicano Por La Causa, Tope High School. 
and I was introduced to, um, to food production in the desert. And coming from California, I was blown away. I said, well, you guys are watermelon and tomatoes. And, and um, I was recruited to then teach at Changemaker High School. Uh, at Changemaker High School, over the past couple years, we've been able to develop uh, really good relationships with the Community Food Bank, we've been able to develop relationships with uh, Tucson Auto Ball and Sierra Club, all these different organizations that focus on conservation, that focus on people, and that focus on, on the environment. This past year, um, if you can help me jump to the, to the next slide. This past year, we, um, I became the, the manager of the Restorative Urban Ecology and Agriculture Program. And I created this 10-week program that takes students through an intensive uh, training that focuses, that starts off with food, the built environment and the natural environment. It really starts off with urban hikes. I take my students out of the classroom, right, because the classroom can be a very confining space, and we take these urban hikes. We, you know, we, we often don't have the resources to go to Sawal National Park or, or you know, to go up to the Grand Canyon. And so we'll hike around the neighborhood. And the students quickly realize that there's a lack of shade, that the food <laughs> that is that food that is in front of them at the at the corner stores or at Fry's is not from there. And they begin to realize that there's a lot of problems. There isn't pedestrian. Uh, Walk, uh, biking lanes, pedestrian sidewalks. And so part of the program is to get students to observe their built, their natural environment, and then to start talking about food. It really starts off with food. The school is now looking at its, at, at its, uh, at its campus as uh, all these outdoor living laboratories right, where different uh, teachers are monitoring greenhouses, they're monitoring the the water in our aquaponics system. Uh, I'm out there with my urban agriculture class, uh, running the farmer's market. The, the program is, is broken up into 10 weeks, right? And when I, when I first started farming here in Arizona, I realized that it, you know, the, the water is so important, right? And Chris talked about it. Um, I also realized, you realize quickly, right? Climate change is real. Uh, we also realized that um, that that it really takes people right and to, to make make things uh, happen right gardens uh, a lot of a lot of these urban gardens require a lot of energy human energy um, and coming to, moving into the desert we also quickly realize that a lot of the food is being shipped here right? but when we when we take our when we take our students out into the garden, we realize that we cannot just teach them about food production. We have to teach them about seed saving. We have to teach them about uh, creating their seed saving stories. Uh, some of our students uh, come.